Welcome to Best Sega Master System Reviews by Classic Game Room, a super fun collection of some of my favorite Sega Master System, SG-1000, and Sega Mark III reviews that I've produced over the years. The Mark III is the Japanese Master System. Now, how many of you owned an NES back in the day? Raise your hands. Okay, I'm looking through the screen. A whole lot of you. How many of you owned an Atari 7800 Pro System? This guy, which makes me a professional. Now, how many of you owned the Sega Master System? Not nearly as many as the NES, but you were the lucky ones who got to enjoy games like Shinobi, Fantasy Zone, OutRun, and Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Let's kick this collection of reviews off with my review of the Sega Master System. Enjoy. Feel the precursor to blast processing. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where we wave goodbye to Sega Master System Week and say hello to Video Game Console Week, starting with the Sega Master System. There's some overlap here. This is the Sega Master System Power Base, released in 1986. It's an 8-bit video game system that plays an extensive library of Sega Master System games. This was the mid-80s direct competitor to the Nintendo Entertainment System. As you can see, the controllers look very similar. The Sega Master System is actually a redesigned Sega Mark III which was the successor to the Sega Mark II and the SG-1000. The Master System was very popular worldwide because of its incredible game library and accessories like 3D glasses and the Sega Light Phaser. There's a lot of great arcade-style light gun games on this thing. But sadly, even with a technical diagram on the front of it, it never took off in the US. The Sega Master System was destroyed commercially by the NES, and even to this day remains a relatively obscure game system in America. The Master System plays mega cartridges as well as some card-based games. The cartridges have a little lip on the back of them that makes them easier to rip out of your Master System and replace with other games, such as Shinobi. Technically, this part of the Master System is referred to as the Power Base. And yes, you can get a Power Base converter for your Sega Genesis or Mega Drive to play Master System games on it. And by the way, the Sega Game Gear is basically a portable Master System. Styling-wise, this thing is kind of awkward. It's as though somebody taped a bunch of triangles together. It lacks the clean, iconic styling of the NES. But Master System fans will tell you it stands out from the crowd, and you can spot one a mile away. Technically, it is more powerful than the Nintendo Entertainment System, and many of the games show that. Games like Shinobi and Rampage look great on the Master System. With bold colors and great sound effects. I also like the controller a lot. The Master System is compatible with Sega Genesis controllers as well as the Sega Genesis Model 1 power supply and Model 1 video cables, both of which I'm using. Technically, it's impressive. It's clearly built to last since it's still working. But the best reason to collect for the Master System is the games, because there's a lot of them. And who doesn't like games like OutRun, Shinobi, the original, Fantasy Star, Zillion 2, Zaxxon 3D, Gangster Town, and so many, many more. Including at least two of them where Stallone takes his shirt off. And who looks better shirtless, Rocky or Mario or Danan Jungle Fighter? Games were being released for this thing well into the 90s, and it's a really affordable game system to collect for today. I also like the friendly intro screen that tells you how to start a game and then reminds you to enjoy. Sadly, I never had a Master System when I was a kid. I 
opted for the Atari 7800. That's right, I'm an Atari fanboy. But I've been impressed with the Master System games since I've been producing classic game romance. Now for the first time, I have a real Sega Master System, thanks to Chris from Jersey City. New, New Jersey. Jersey! So there you go, it's a cool game system with a lot of games, some great accessories, it still works. And it's reasonably affordable to collect for, it's the master of all things. It's the, the Sega, Sega Master, master system. system. Pause button is on the game system, not the controller. Welcome to Classic Game Room. Do you like Alex Kidd? Do you like Shinobi? Do you like Sega? If so, you're going to love this game. It's Alex Kidd in Shinobi World on the Master System. It's a tale that many of us know all too well. Young love, viciously interrupted by an evil dark ninja who escapes captivity after 10,000 years. What is Alex Kidd? To do? Well, he could just find another girlfriend, but that would be a boring game. And this isn't a boring game because it's Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Sega's former mascot, before he was replaced by Sonic the Hedgehog, kicks ass in this 1990 entry into the excellent Alex Kidd series, Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Which is exactly what it sounds like it is. Only Alex Kidd could be so precise, spinning on a light post, slaughtering enemies with ninja skills. This game is obviously far closer to Shinobi than Alex Kidd in Miracle World, and I find it absolutely delightful in every way. I'm sorry, Robster Dinner. It's a relatively short game, but it has such a great style and it plays really well. I love the mashup between two of Sega's greatest franchises. So now I'm obviously waiting for Alex Kidd in Thunder Force World. This isn't one of the more challenging games in this genre, but by level 4 it definitely starts to put up a fight. One of the things that makes it cool though and gives it a lot of replay value is that there's hidden stuff everywhere. So while you may be able to make it through the game after a couple playthroughs, finding everything is a different story. And uh, actually level 4 is pretty tricky. Because this is one of those games that makes you go through all of the end bosses a second time. Like, didn't I demoralize them the first time I killed them? And as far as I can tell, this robster is shooting potato chips at me. Like, isn't that a good thing? Alex Kidd should be catching them and getting power-ups from potato chips. Come on, Sega, you dropped the ball on that one. the weird ass helicopter thing. On the whole, I would say that Alex Kidd in Shinobi World is a bit unbalanced. Parts of the game are way too easy while other parts are super challenging. It's probably not as good as Alex Kidd in Miracle World, to be honest, but it's still super fun and really dirt cheap to collect as well. The hidden stuff can be pretty tricky to collect. In fact, there's a lot of jumps I still haven't figured out yet, but on the whole, for those of us not good at these games, if you like platformers but you suck at them like me, Alex Kidd in Shinobi World is approachable and fun. And I've got a classic game room. Shout out and thank you to send to a different Alex. This game came from Alex in Diesborg, Germany. Thank you for sending Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Alan 
10,000, you have forsaken me! I didn't even mention it, but the music in this game is great. Turn it up. In fact, I'm actually playing this one with the Sega Mark III and the Master System Converter, which just happens to be in better shape than my Master System. This one doesn't have any extra FM sound, like Thunderblade or Aleste, but what sound there is, is still really good. And remember that you have to be running a little bit to jump. That killed me countless times. Great game. Alex Kidd in Shinobi World. Highly recommended for your Sega Master System. against aliens. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I've got a game that'll require you to stay frosty, as well as keeping your Sega Light Phaser handy for close encounters of the Sega Master System kind. It's Space Gun. You gotta love the music in this game. Don't shoot the civilians! Or else bad things happen. Also, you get points for them. It's Space Gun, which is like a gun in space. Basically, this game is aliens on the Sega Master System with the Sega Light Phaser. Yeah! Go back to whatever alien hellhole you come from. No! I shot a civilian. Sorry. Did I get penalized for that? Yes, they're no longer your friend. This is a 1992 release on the Sega Master System, a late release for the 1986 8-bit Sega game console based on Taito's 1990 arcade machine. Somebody left a window in space open. Shut those windows. You're letting out all the heat as well as the atmosphere, and we're all going to die. Space Gun is an extremely cool game, but not quite as exciting as the awesome intro screen and name would lead you to believe. It's actually a bit slow, and not terribly difficult. I've, I've never seen the arcade game, so I can't compare the two. But one of the neat features here is that you can choose your own path through the game. Sometimes it gives you a choice. Do you go straight down the hallway like this, kind of like Zybots? Or do you go side-scrolling like Operation Wolf, except not nearly as hard? Your mission is simple. Destroy all the aliens while avoiding the humans. Score points, survive, move on with your life. After a while, I actually craved the fast-paced excitement found in other Sega Master System games like Shooting Gallery. Murphy! What? Save the humans! Not human! Die! I rescued four persons. That's good. Now we eject them out the airlock. They just take up space. Monsters attack the crew! Will any of them survive? The monsters or the crew? Wait, who are we fighting for? Oh, shit. That one's like an armored monster. What if the people I saved were replicants? Does that still count? Now, in addition to the awesome clicking sound made by the Sega Light Phaser, I really dig the music in Space Gun. Human, yes! Another human saved. Looks like an ice cream sandwich. I also love the aliens inspired art design. Oh, these little guys are all dead in the background. Clearly, these developers enjoyed 1986's Aliens as much as I do. And I'm okay with that. However, the game's not as good as Aliens. 
It's also not as good as Gangster Town. It's just too damn slow. Now, as you play through Space Gun, the things that you collect, which look like colorful ice cream sandwiches, are actually special weapons. And you have to play with the Sega Master System controller, in addition to the light phaser, in order to activate them. They're great for destroying end bosses. Yeah! Space Gun! Sega light phaser. Makes the pulse rifle look like the NES Zapper. Uh -huh. I came up with this John Woo movie style inspired way of holding the light phaser in one hand while keeping the Master System controller beneath it for additional balance and support. It's a pretty sweet spaceship. I rescued six persons. All communication from Starbase R has ceased. Maybe they ran out of batteries. Dumbass colonists. Take command of a space shuttle and investigate. I'm going to investigate with the power of my Sega light phaser. Die, mother... I found the game to be a little bit too easy, maybe because I'm standing three inches from the television screen, but it's also a slow-paced light gun game. It's not bad, but it's not one of the best that I've played on the Master System. However, I do have a classic game room. Shout out. And thank you to send all the way to Germany this time to Alexander from Diesburg, Germany, who sent many great games to the show, including this one. So thank you, Alexander, once again. It's Space Gun. More like Space Fun. <laughs> Murfuck! Uh oh. We've arrived at the starbase. Are the occupants in danger? <laughs> no, they look quite safe. Now in the movie Aliens, they ask, what are you gonna use, harsh language? Well, I'm gonna try that. Fuck you, die. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Gotta use the light phaser. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where you know I love the Sega Master System, but some games like this one just require the extra power of the Sega Genesis Blast Processing to really be good. This is Altered Beast on the Master System. Alrighty then, it's more Altered Beast. Back in 1989 when I bought my original first Sega Genesis, the one I still use today, it came with Altered Beast. So it's a game I like because it's, it's fun, it's cheesy, and it brings back those, those good memories. Obviously it was one of the first games I had for my Genesis, and I just recently reviewed Altered Beast on the Nintendo Famicom where it looks and sounds completely different from the Genesis or arcade versions. Now, here's the Sega Master System 8-bit version of Altered Beast, which is incredibly disappointing on so many levels. For starters, we don't get the awesome voice dialogue at the beginning, and instead of rising, wising from his grave, he's rising from the crave. I didn't even know that was possible. Hey, at least we get power up. Alright, the game's got that going for it, but what it doesn't have is any kind of playable controls whatsoever. This, this is actually a terrible version of Altered Beast. In fact, I prefer the Famicom one, which doesn't look very good, but it's way more fun to play. So, let me elaborate. In order to properly enjoy Altered Beast, you really need three buttons. One to punch, one to kick, and one to jump. The Famicom version managed to get around this by allowing you to jump when you pushed up on the D-pad. Well, here on the Master System, they require you to push buttons 1 and 2 at the same time. So if you miss a jump, if you don't hit the buttons properly, you're just going to bounce from enemy to enemy to enemy until you die. And I think that's the exact same sound I made every time that happened, so they must have just recorded some annoyed player playing Altered Beast 
and put it into the game for yucks. Because the controls suck, they completely ruin Altered Beast, and I thought the the weird Famicom version was like a Trojan horse, like Sega could show off the Famicom version next to the Genesis version and, and demonstrate, you know, oh look how much better the Genesis is, Sega does what Nintendo don't, but in, in this case, Nintendo did what Sega couldn't do, they delivered a playable 8-bit version of Altered Beast. So maybe this was Sega's attempt to get Master System owners to upgrade to the Genesis or Mega Drive, because games like Altered Beast or Sonic the Hedgehog were really meant for the 16-bit era. And they didn't translate really well to the earlier Sega, but I've still got a shout out and classic game room super thank you to send all the way to my man Al from Chicago, Illinois. Thank you, Al. There it is on the map. Chicago, Altered Beast on the Master System, unresponsive buttons, irritating jumping, and it's single player only. This is the best example I've seen where Sega does what Sega don't. Altered Beast is better on the Genesis. Welcome to Classic Game Room, this is Sega Genesis fanboy Mark making a guest appearance on the show today to bring you the review of the Sega Mark III. While it's not a Sega Genesis, it is like an ancient ancestor to the Genesis, and that means it's rad to the max. Of course it's rad to the max, this thing is named Mark, the Mark III. Three. Did you know that Mark, or Marcus, according to some sources, means God of War, or to be warlike, Warhammer, manliest of men, and raddest of Segas? The Mark III is basically the Japanese Master System, a somewhat redesigned Sega SG-1000 Mark II with a more powerful processor and several other features and changes that make it the SG-1000 to own even, even if it's the Mark III. Three, it's backwards compatible with SG-1000 games. You just plug them right in there and have a good time. Let's look at some other improvements over the Mark II. This has the card slot built into it. Controller ports have been moved to the front and most importantly, it's compatible with the Sega Genesis Model 1 power supply and AV cables. No longer do you have to run it through a VCR or RF adapter. Channel 96? Don't worry about it, just go straight in through your composite video. There's a ton of excellent SG-1000 games out there, and a bunch that are for the Mark III or Japanese Sega Master System. There's no shortage of games, but I am saddened by the fact they removed the lengthy marketing description from the front of the game console, seen here on the SG-1000 Mark II. The styling is very similar, they're roughly the same size. You can see the Mark II has the controller ports in the back. There's your old school video output, like the Atari. And you'll have to run that through channel 96 somehow. I recommend a VCR. The Mark II is an excellent game system, but the Mark III does one-up it. Because it's a master system. And the master system is awesome, we all know that. In fact, if you look at a master system, it's basically the same thing. The master system will even run with the same cables and power supply. The Sega SG-1000 required use of the card catcher to play the Sega My Cards. The Mark III just has it built right in. It's got a little door here that protects the cartridge slot, and while it's not a terribly attractive game system, it gets the job done. And that job is playing awesome video games. I've been using this with the Genesis Model 1 power supply cables and the Sega Master System controller, although it does come with its own controller, the Joypad. That looks like this. The Mark III is so similar to the Sega Master System, I wondered if it would play Western Master System games. Nope, now they don't, they don't fit in. Different cartridge sizes, but those Sega cards look to be pretty similar. I, I wonder if F-16 Fighting Falcon for the Master System will play in the Mark III. This is either going to work or it'll explode. Don't try this at home. F-16 Fighting Falcon is inserted, turn on. 
Yes! It works! I'm now playing a Master System game on the Mark III, although it doesn't seem to work the opposite direction. I've either been foiled again or Bomb Jack just won't play on the Master System, it's hard to say. But I can declare that the Mark III is... is amazing. I've, I've really enjoyed all the SG-1000 games that I've played, and this opens up the Mark III games as well. As a Sega fanboy, it's nice to own a piece of Sega history and play some classic Sega games. All this enjoyment doesn't come cheap, though. The Mark III will set you back a couple bucks, for sure. And the earlier SG-1000 isn't really all that much less expensive, either. However, Master Systems are dirt cheap. But then you don't get the awesome SG-1000 games, and I think they're super cool. So how about a classic game room shout out and thank you all the way to Chris from Jersey City in, wait for it, New, New Jersey. Jersey. Thank you Chris for sending not one, not two, but three marks. It's the Sega Mark III and, and the game where that schoolgirl kicks the crap out of ninjas. Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I bring you the review of one of the all-time great Sega games. This is Fantasy Zone on the Sega Mark III. Fantasy Zone, released in 1986, may look like a delightful, cheerful game, but in fact, it's out to kill you. Looks are deceiving. Fantasy Zone is like Defender with a sugar high. If you let your guard down for just a moment, this game will hand you your own ass. Along with a side of really good music. There's a lot going on here. Fantasy Zone is actually a pretty complex game. It's more than just a spaceship shooter. It's like a spaceship shooter combined with an adventure game. And this is actually one of Sega's better-known franchises that they haven't done a whole lot with in the last couple years. It's been kind of absent from their lineup for the last few decades, actually, despite a few references to the Opa Opa spaceship here and there, which is great. Fantasy Zone seems to have gone the way of Alex Kidd, into forced retirement, and for what? More crappy Sonic games? Fantasy Zone is great, and spawned numerous sequels, most of which came out in the 80s. But why is it great? What makes this game so good? Well, despite the obvious art design and brilliant music, the ship in Fantasy Zone handles in a somewhat erratic fashion. It's like you're piloting a living thing with flapping wings, which, well, you kind of are. It's like it has a mind of its own at times, and the enemies... The enemies act drunk. They'll come at you slowly, kind of moving around in circles, and then dart towards you really fast, and then fire stuff, and then just sort of float away. Without a care in the world. It's like, what the hell is going on in this game? I love it. Check out the store system, that's right, you collect coins after you defeat enemies and the bases that spawn enemies, and then spend them in the store. On speed upgrades, new weapons, extra lives, and bombs. There's actually quite a bit of strategy in Fantasy Zone, because your weapon power-ups don't last very long, so you really can't rely on them, but you can stockpile bombs. That's something I learned after reading a walkthrough online once I got stuck on level 3. Buy a heavy bomb. That thing will wipe out most everything. 
Watch out though, prices do go up. Fantasy Zone has high inflation. Also, approach your enemies cautiously. Keep your distance. Basically what you do in each level is destroy all of the bases, which are pretty tough. In fact, until you get used to the game and each level, they may even appear camouflaged against, against the background. I've never seen the arcade version of this game. While the Master System version looks really good, sometimes it's tough to tell the foreground from the background. Just fire at them until they're gone, keeping an eye out for enemies that just come flying at you from every direction, of course. Then you'll battle an end boss, most of whom can be wiped out easily with that heavy bomb if you can survive that long. And even then, Fantasy Zone's pretty brutal by levels 5 and 6. It's putting up quite a fight. One good strategy is to fly close to the ground. In fact, why not just walk on it? Your spaceship has legs. More spaceships need legs. It's a great feature. It gives your wings a bit of a break and prevents most of the enemies from flying into you. Fantasy Zone was pretty popular, so it can be found fairly easily. It's reasonably affordable on the Sega Mark III and the Western Sega Master System. You can also pick this game up for the NES. And I even reviewed a version of it for the Sega Game Gear a while back. I'm pretty impressed with the Mark III version here, which I assume is the same thing as the Master System. It plays really well, looks good, sounds good. You'll definitely want a good controller for this game though, especially if you rely on any of these speed power-ups, which I would be wary of. Because this game gets like Truxton fast. You know when you pick up all the speed power-ups in Truxton? The ship basically becomes uncontrollable and you just fly into things. Well, that same thing happens in Fantasy Zone. Personally, I like the big wings, which reminds me of big wheels, which were awesome. Also, it's like a slight speed upgrade, but not too fast. Just fast enough to get out of the way, but not so fast that you fly face first into everything. My favorite weapon power-ups are the spread shot or the wide shot, but sadly they don't last very long. So most of the time you end up just using the twin lasers, which do the job. Just save some heavy bombs, which rain from the sky bringing death and destruction with a smile. Because this game is so cheerful. Right up until the moment when it finally breaks you. Fantasy Zone! Highly recommended. There it is, Fantasy Zone. I love the artwork on the cartridge. It's colorful, it's cheerful. It perfectly represents Fantasy Zone. And here is Fantasy Zone 2. I treated myself to the Fantasy Zone games after uh, the Classic Game Room Patreon launch. And even picked up a copy of Fantasy Zone I think it's called Fantasies on the Maze, or Opa Opa, which is really cool. It's like Fantasy Zone reimagined as Pac-Man. These three games are remarkable, so if you, if you like Fantasy Zone, they really won't break the bank, and they're totally worth it. Really fun games. Fantasy Zone 1, 2, and 3, and the artwork looks great on all of them, so highly recommended. Fantasy Zone! Look at that great cartridge artwork. Although I think this one's my favorite. It's eating a giant coin. I mean, come on. How can you not like that? Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything.
Welcome to Classic Game Room. Are you in the mood for a driving game or Pac-Man? Why not combine the two? This is Pac-Car for the Sega SG-1000. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a catchy tune like Pac-Man, but it does have a little car and lots of super cool features that make this Pac-Man clone stand out from the crowd. Released in 1983 for the Sega SG-1000, I'm playing it here using the Sega Mark III. It's a good game. Pack Car or Pacar comes from the era when half the games released to home game consoles were nothing more than clones of Pac-Man or Space Invaders, two of the most popular arcade games from the era. The difference here is that Pac Car is similar enough to Pac Man to give it that familiar feel that we all love, but so different to make it a completely unique game. One that's very, very clever. What jumped out at me first, in addition to the great name Pac Car, come on, that just says it all. What jumped out at me was the maze design, which has bridges and underpasses. It's like you're looking at an MC Escher drawing. And when the game gets really fast, it's like your brain is about to explode trying to figure out which paths go over and what goes under. Also, as you may have just noticed, your car doesn't just change directions like Pac-Man. I mean, that would be unrealistic. It has a reverse gear, which is slower than driving forward. Also, there's no limit to the amount of cars that you can eat after collecting a randomly generated power pellet. Watch out for the evil red car, which is faster than the other cars, and don't forget that you have two speeds, normal and turbo, which is similar to Super Pac-Man. In fact, this game actually has a couple things that I think were inspired by Super Pac-Man. For example, watch this. You know how in Pac-Man, the score of the ghosts goes 200, 400, 800, 1600. In Pack Car, it'll go all the way up to 3200. And you can keep it there if you chain power pellets together. So one great strategy to getting a high score and lots of extra cars is to hover around the garage area and continue eating them as they drive out. Big money, big prizes, Pack Car. Seriously, you want this game. Of course, like much in life, it's never that simple. Pack Car is relatively obscure. I think it's a Sega SG-1000 exclusive, which means it'll also play on the SC-3000 computer and Sega Mark III. They should have added the beep, beep, beep sound for the reverse gear. That would have been great. Pack Car isn't horribly overpriced, but it's not inexpensive. Either. On, on the whole, I find that it's fairly easy to collect for the Sega SG-1000 and Mark III if you're willing to shop on eBay. As far as I can tell, Pack Car alternates screens and then gives you levels with one bad guy, then two bad guys, then three bad guys, then it goes back to one and increases speed, eventually pushing your reflexes and weakling human brain to its limits. While you score points by eating dots and completing levels like Pac-Man, you score the big points by eating enemy cars. Hopefully a whole lot of them all at once. At 3200, that really racks up the points. And of course, I have a classic game room. Shout out and thank you going all the way to Mark and Suzanne once again from East Meadow, New York. Thank you, Mark, who sent a little note with this game that said it's like Pac-Man with cars, but Mark... It's so much more than that. In fact, one could say that Pac-Man is like Pac-Car, without a reverse gear. As you can probably tell, I can't say enough good things about this game. It was a real surprise. I've never heard of it. Until now. Happy hunting, because if you think it looks fun, it is. Definitely one of the best Pac-Man clones I've ever played. Pac-Car! 
please, oh please let there be a sequel called Ms. Pat Carr. Pat Carr. Huh. What do they think of next? Here's my mighty Sega Mark III where they have the marketing message right on the front of it. This computer video game console designed for simple operation is guaranteed to give you the maximum in gameplay satisfaction. And here is my game cartridge for Pat Carr. Pat Carr, not, not Pitfall 2. That review's coming later. I don't have the box art for this one, which I've seen online, and it's great. I assume they thought they would get sued if it was Pack Car, so they just combined it. And to Pacar. Banished from Earth, classic game room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I bring you ninjas and Sega. Before there was a revenge of, there was just Shinobi on your Sega Mark III. I like how he walked out from behind his own game cartridge there in the opening shot. From 1987, it's the Sega Mark III version of Sega's arcade game, Shinobi, the first one. The first of many. And definitely one of the more challenging ones. This game is tough. Shinobi will put you in your place. You've heard games described as NES hard, right? Well, that's Shinobi, even if it's on the Master System, or the Mark III in this case. Same thing. It's NES hard. This is one of these games that I like, but I'm not any good at. And it doesn't help that the first boss is like the hardest boss in the game. I don't know what I was doing wrong, but getting past this guy seems to be random. I think my favorite part of the game is the sound effect he makes while jumping. I wish I made that sound effect. That'd be fun, I'd jump everywhere. Shinobi is pretty basic compared to its impressive sequels like Revenge of Shinobi, Shadow Dancer, and Shinobi 3. It's an extremely rigid game, one that benefits from level memorization. The enemies don't really move around a whole lot. Eventually, I think you'll find the greatest challenge is the end bosses. Because once you memorize the levels, you'll get a system in place. The more of those children that you save, the more power Shinobi gets, the greater your life bar. Because as we all know, Shinobi fights for the children of the future of the world. One of the things with Shinobi is that you want to try to take out as many enemies from a distance as possible. If you get surrounded, it's easy to take damage, and then you get knocked into an enemy, and then you just get knocked right back into the same enemy, and until you're dead. So what I like to do is just tr try to kill everything before you even see it. Just throw a knife and then walk after it. That way, your knife or your ninja star or whatever will meet your enemies before you do, because you have shinobi skills. You can throw things very slowly. Speaking of shinobi skills, if you're a real ninja, you should have no problem with the bonus stage. If you rescue a certain number of children, you unlock the bonus stage. Throw ninja stars at the ninjas jumping towards you. I'm not sure I've ever actually completed this level. This is how you get magic, but you know, if I really wanted magic, then I wouldn't be a ninja, I'd be a freaking wizard. And that would be a different game. I love how it's believable in a 2D game that the bad guy can't just look up and stab you in the foot. He's just gonna sit there and throw that sword at the wall until you eventually throw a ninja star into his face. They're not that bright, are they? Also, as you rescue the uh, hostages or whatever, you also upgrade your power, your health, and your weapons. You get nunchucks and a chain and a grenade. Shinobi's a good game. I, I personally prefer the Sega Genesis ones, like The Revenge of Shinobi. If you've never played a Shinobi game before, start with that one on the Genesis or the Mega Drive. 
But the first Shinobi is really good too. It is super old school. So if you're collecting for the Master System or the Sega Mark III, you'll have no problem finding this game. It's really cheap out there. It's easy to find. And I've got a classic game room. Shout out and thank you to send. Here's a crowd favorite. Going all the way to Chris from Jersey City. New Jersey! Shinobi's a great game for your Master System or Mark III collection. I think it was surpassed by its excellent sequels, and the Shinobi game on PlayStation 2 is pretty cool, too. I'll be reviewing that soon. It's always a great time to rock out to some Sega Mark III here on Classic Game Room. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Shinobi was defeated by those stupid spinning carnival rides. Ninjas. They'll never learn. You gotta love the Sega Mark III cartridge designs. I love the gold and the red, and it says Mark III up here, Master System. And the Shinobi one is actually one of the better looking cartridge designs I've seen. I love just the ninja here, and there's fighting, and dude with a mohawk, and the guy with the sleazy ponytail, and there's like swords and ninja action. This is a great looking Sega Mark III game. It's a great game too, obviously, but... Uh, definitely complemented by the sweet cartridge artwork, so uh, check it out. Shinobi for the Sega Master System. I'm so sorry, I'm reading Master System. The Sega Mark III, which is basically the Sega Master System. You can also get this for the Sega Master System, but the Sega Master System one doesn't have the gold cartridge like this one. <laughs> Sega Master System Week continues with Assault City on the Sega Master System, a game that seems like it should be played with the Sega Light Phaser, but it isn't. Even though it should. Assault City. This game begins with a shooting gallery scene where you move your cursor around the screen using your Sega Master System controller and shoot robots. Or you're supposed to. If you do well, the game is really hard. If you do poorly and make mistakes, then Assault City is much easier. Either way, it feels really half-baked. This features a pretty in-depth story for the era and some nice-looking artwork. Setting the stage for this horrible post-apocalyptic future where you're shooting robots or something and then drops you into what feels like it should be a light gun shooting game, except it isn't. You move the cursor around the screen using the D-pad on your Sega Master System controller. Shooting enemies before they shoot you. Scoring points. Saving the future. But doesn't the future have light guns? The Sega Master System does. And that's where it all goes wrong. Now it's not until after I played this game that I discovered there's two versions of Assault City. This one and the one that does use the Sega Light Phaser. So it's like the physical copy of a downloadable patch. For what it's worth, that makes reviewing this game a lot easier because I can recommend the game stylistically. I think the art is really cool. I, I like the storyline. I like the music. I even like the gameplay if I could just use the Sega Light Phaser. So basically, just be careful which version of Assault City you buy. Apparently, the light gun supported one has a red picture of a light gun on the front of the packaging. I don't actually have the packaging because this was sent to the show by my man Alexander from Diesborg, Germany, who sent the wrong version of the game. Alexander, did you know? Did you know that you broke my heart? Because you did. As you play through Assault City, you have a life meter and you level up your gun by shooting the silver floaty things and then collecting the red power-ups that look like they come straight out of Musha or robo -Alest. I think shooting the yellow one is bad. That seems to take power away from the gun. Even though it's actually just the Master System D-pad. 
what what they what they do? Did, did they release the game and then realize, whoops, oh, we forgot to support the the light gun peripheral? My bad. I think that's exactly what they did. And you know they had this meeting where this one guy was in the corner sweating through his shirt, thinking to himself, is it is it expensive to re-release a game? Maybe nobody will notice. The internet doesn't exist yet, so classic game room won't have a chance to cover it. <laughs> Until now. Now you're busted. So thanks again to Alexander from Diesborg, Germany, who's already on the map, and I was going to point to it with the Sega Light Phaser, but instead I'll just use the D-pad on the Master System controller. It's a Salt City, a game I had never heard of, and I think it's a really cool game. Just be careful which version you buy, because you want the one that uses the Sega Light Phaser. At least I think you do. I haven't played that version yet, but from what I can tell, it should be very cool. Assault City. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of one of my favorite games on Sega Mark III. It's Opa Opa, which is also known as Fantasy Zone The Maze for the Master System. And yes, it's amazing! When Classic Game Room Mark III launched in early 2016, I celebrated by treating myself to a couple Mark three games that I did not have, including Fantasy Zone 1 and 2, and this one, Opa Opa, for the Sega Mark III, which is known as Fantasy Zone The Maze elsewhere. You can see that it doesn't really resemble the other Fantasy Zone games. In fact, it looks kind of odd. You're flying the Opa Opa spaceship, hero of Fantasy Zone through mazes, collecting dots, so so it's like a Pac-Man clone featuring one of Sega's best mascots, right? No. No. It's way more than that. Love the drum roll. This is one of the best games that you can get for your Sega Mark III or Master System. You won't leave this review without wanting a copy. Thankfully, it's pretty cheap. Opa Opa, or Fantasy Zone The Maze, is a brilliant reimagining of the Fantasy Zone formula in the Pac-Man universe. And it took me a while to figure this game out. For starters, I think you need to appreciate Fantasy Zone. The ultra-incredible, adorable, side-scrolling spaceship shooter from Sega. If you haven't played Fantasy Zone, you really won't get what's going on here. You score bonus points by getting through the mazes quickly, but the real challenge is surviving. Because in Fantasy Zone, which plays a lot like Defender, you're shooting bases that spawn enemies. In Opa Opa, the bases are like the ghosts in Pac-Man, except you can destroy them, and you want to destroy them before they fill the maze with fast-moving bad guys because they spawn enemies, it's brilliant, but you have to buy all of your weapons, and you've only got so much money. You don't just get power pellets for free in Opa Opa, you need to invest wisely. You earn gold by eating the uh, dots on the maze, obviously, but also by destroying enemies. And there's bonus rounds in between worlds. But like Fantasy Zone, the more that you buy, the higher the price. And the weapons only last so long, so it's best to play as far through the game without buying anything as you can, but you definitely need to buy some lasers from time to time, because if you don't clear out the bases, you won't survive. Especially once the game gets hard. This level in particular took me a while to figure out. You've got to play it aggressively. Do not let the enemies begin to spawn. 
Now, you may have noticed that red dot in the middle of the screen as well. That's important. Hitting that will stop enemies from respawning, but be careful, you can also easily run into them. There's, there's so much going on in this game. Sure, it, it's maybe a Pac-Man clone, but it's a Pac-Man clone in the Fantasy Zone. Which is like the complete opposite of whatever horror takes place in the R-Zone. Now that red super power up is the best one in the game, but it's expensive, especially if you buy it more than once. And you've got to be careful not to accidentally buy things that you don't want more than once, or you'll find yourself without any gold. And then you're screwed. Here's one of the bonus mazes where you can score some extra gold. The fact is, the more you play Opa Opa, the more you'll get the feel for each of the mazes in each of the worlds. And you'll develop some strategies so that you don't have to constantly buy weapons, because they add up fast. And uh, that's, that's one of the things I like about this game. There's a million and one different ways to score points in Opa Opa. No two games ever play even remotely the same. Now, let's get to the next part of this review, which is the controller that you'll need to play Opa Opa. You'll want a good one, and there's not many options available on the Master System and Sega Mark III. Greatest Sega Mark III controller on Earth right here. The Allen 9000. Made by Allen. I've been playing this with an arcade quality joystick from my friend Alan in West Virginia. Here's a look at it. We dubbed it the Alan 9000. No! No! Search for that guy on eBay. If you don't have one of those, you'll want the best Master System or Mark III gamepad that you can find because you need a good controller for Opa Opa, especially when the enemies start moving really fast. Now, each of my games always ends the same way. At some point, I run out of money. And without weapons, there's just no way to survive the later levels. You can't afford anything, and then you're doomed. So, mastering the early levels is critical. This game is amazing. You absolutely want a copy of Opa Opa or Fantasy Zone The Maze. Super highly recommended. We all need a trip to the Fantasy Zone every now and then. Sega Master System. OutRun is one of Sega's most popular and most well-known arcade titles developed by Yu Suzuki, who designed or produced and directed a number of Sega games that you may be familiar with, like Hang On, Afterburner 2, Virtua Cop, Shenmue, and Ferrari F355 Challenge. Outrun's a pretty awesome game, and I spent a lot of time in the arcade playing this. There was one that had one of the stand-up versions of Outrun with the steering wheel, and uh, I played that quite a bit. And the thing that always, that always amazed me about Outrun was the hills. Because back in the day, back in the 80s, most driving games did not have hills. I always liked driving games, and the, the ones I spent most of the time playing were at Pole Position and Pole Position 2 on my Atari 7800, so Outrun just just blew me away. And Outrun remains my favorite arcade-style driving game ever created. I haven't played Outrun for many years, and when I recently picked up my Sega Power Base Converter, this is one of the first games I bought with it.
And I spent hours playing Outrun, reliving the glory days of standing in the arcade, plugging quarters into my Ferrari Testarossa. And there's a great article in Retro Gamer Magazine, that, and it's the issue that has Outrun on the front cover, that goes into depth on the game and the creation. And the thing about Outrun that makes it stand apart, and certainly made it stand apart back back in the day when it was released in the late 80s, is that you're not just driving on a racetrack, trying to memorize a racetrack. You're driving on the open road, sort of. You have a variety of different paths that you can take to get to the end of Outrun as well, which was like a, you know, a whole new thing back then. I remember thinking this game was like the choose-your-own-adventure of driving games, because you literally chose your own path. You could go through the mountains, you could go underneath those um, archaeological stone things that, that, for whatever reason, were hanging over the road. There's the level with windmills. There's the desert. That's actually a really hard one, and I avoid that one at all costs. choice of car is really exciting, the Ferrari Testarossa, back when they had one of these in Miami Vice, remember they had the white one? They had the black Daytona, but then they ended up getting the white Testarossa at one point. There's some games out today that still give you that feeling that Outrun, that Outrun does. Uh, Test Drive Unlimited is one that I, I enjoy a lot for the Xbox 360. Another game that puts you out on on real roads in traffic rather than just confining you on a racetrack. Let's get to the Sega Master System version of this game and how it compares to the arcade. I also review the Sega Genesis version of OutRun. The Genesis is a more powerful game system, so here on the Master System we're looking at a more rudimentary, rudimentary version of OutRun, but it still looks good. There's a lot of flicker, there's some things like the, the palm trees at the beginning that pop on and off the screen. But overall, the game is solid, the gameplay is, is very good, and the controls are excellent. On the Sega Master System version, unlike the Genesis version, which is, which is different, and we'll get into that in the other review, you shift gears by pushing up and down. Sometimes this can be a bit complicated because there's no sound effect for the car. So you, sometimes you can knock yourself out of gear if you're turning left and right and just happen to slip up and down. If you knock your car out of gear, you might not notice right away because you can't hear anything, and that sometimes screws up your time a bit. It's a minor gripe. This is one of those rare two-speed Ferrari Testarossas. They don't make them anymore. Similar to Enduro for the Atari 2600, you want to avoid running into things at all cost. If you hit the obstacles on the side of the road at a high speed, your car spins around and your characters go flying out of it, and you lose a lot of time. If you just bump into cars while you're driving, you merely slow down. So that's not too bad, but you really want to avoid, like, smashing into a windmill at 180 miles an hour. Which you also want to avoid doing that in real life. You only have two buttons, gas and brake. The object of the game is fairly simple, to complete the game as quickly as possible. There's a time at the top middle of the screen. And if you happen to run out of time while you're in uh, the first, second, third, or fourth level, the game ends there. If you get through all the levels, depending on whatever path you want to take. If you get through all the levels, no matter what path you take, you then get to the end and get a whole, uh, whole lot of bonus points. Your score is on the top left. You also get scored for the cars that you pass. It's an exciting game, it has high replay value no matter what version of OutRun you get because you can always try to improve your time. The Master System version is a bit clunky at times because it, it, is, it is jerky, the graphics on screen are jerky, so sometimes you're coming up over a hill and even though you know where a car is, it's just difficult to maneuver around it. Things come at you pretty, pretty quickly sometimes. And it's easier to play on the Sega Genesis version, which is much smoother and just seems more clear. The arcade version was obviously vastly superior in the graphics and sound department. It had a steering wheel. The game benefits from a steering wheel. However, the conversions here for the Master System and the Genesis both play very well with the, with the controllers and the D-pad.
All right, I won camels. Awesome. Not sure what I'm gonna do with the camels though. I don't. I don't know. Now what's this? It looks like he's giving me a magic lamp. May as well rub that magic lamp and see. Oh, holy shit! A harem. Now that's even better than camels. You're gonna have to kick that blonde chick out of your car to fit all those other girls into it. Then you can just uh, strap the camels onto the hood. In any event, when you complete the game or finish driving, they show you the path that you chose to drive and how far along you actually progressed, which is a really nice touch. Being that you choose your own path throughout run, there's a variety of different locations, so we only saw just a couple of them in the review. The game also has three of the songs that were in the arcade version. I think there were only three songs in the arcade version. The, the Sega Genesis version of the game gives you four songs. And they're pretty cool songs. And that's Outrun for the Sega Master System. And doesn't this screen remind you a bit of Darius Gaiden on Sega Saturn, the way you choose your own path through the game? Sit back and relax, it's classic game room time, and I've got the review of Starjacker on Sega SG-1000. When we think of the great video game themes, the truly memorable ones, games like Pac-Man and Super Mario Brothers come to mind, I think Starjacker should be added to that list. It's a little harder to pick up the tune and whistle, but... It kicks Sonic ass nonetheless. Not Sonic's ass, but like sounds... If sound had an ass, this game would kick it. Oh, one spaceship down. As you might expect from the era, released in 1983, Starjacker is hard as nails. Like adamantium nails. It's the only spaceship game that I can think of where you get all of your extra lives at once on screen at the beginning of the game. And it's like a serious liability because you're like, you're like the centipede from Centipede. You're a giant target waiting to be hit. Sure, you have a wider shot pattern, but guiding your convoy of spaceships through each round is... is difficult. You score big bonus points if you can get them all through safely, though. This is similar to games like Xevious in that you shoot air targets, or space targets, and bomb ground targets using both of the Sega SG-1000's buttons. And yes, I'm playing this game with the Master System Controller. Eventually you get down to just one spaceship, which is your last life, obviously. It's harder to hit, but at the same time, you don't shoot very quickly in this game, you, you lose most of your firepower. I don't have the instructions and I can't find out much about this game online. It, it's pretty intuitive for the most part. But every now and then this red thing comes out and if you can shoot one of your shots right into it, it, it zips you through the rest of the level. Uh, to your space aircraft carrier. Every time I plug in the title for this game online or on eBay, it tries to autocorrect it to Star Jacket. I don't want a jacket, I want spaceships. I was trying to find out if this was on the NES or Master System or Commodore 64 or, or something for you, but I think it, it appears to be a Sega SG-1000 exclusive unless they changed the title for it if it was ever re-released. Oh, 
I'm actually playing this one on the Sega Mark III. You can find a game cartridge out there for a reasonable price. It's not terribly expensive. It's such a cool game, it should be more widely available. Instead of 5,000 bad Sonic remakes, Sega should have concentrated on a couple good Starjacker sequels. You know, people frequently bash Nintendo for taking a relatively simple concept and then, then running with it for the next 30 years. Well, I feel like Sega should have tried the same thing with Starjacker. Super Starjacker. Starjacker 64, Starjacker Tactics, Starjacker Kart Racing, Starjacker Volleyball. But only if Team Ninja does that one. Uh, there, there's so many things they could do with Starjacker. Starjacker on the Sega 32X. Starjacker vs. Street Fighter. I mean, the possibilities are, are endless, and of course I've got a classic game room. Shout out and thank you to send to Mark and Suzanne from Fresh Meadows, New York for sending Starjacker. Shoot the last guy in my convoy. If you like a good old school, straightforward, vertical scrolling spaceship shooter with a funky twist, the, the whole convoy thing is pretty neat. And if you dig some great old school music, Starjacker is a game for you. Sadly, the SG-1000 or Sega Mark III doesn't come cheap, but once you get one, the games aren't too bad. And Starjacker is one of these cool hidden gems lost to history that should be found Again, so let's all let's all send Team Ninja an email since we know Sega's sure as hell not gonna do anything about it Number one and uh, let's get that Starjacker volleyball going Starjacker featuring Hitomi in jean shorts and underwear fighting her way through aliens to get to the lollipop store I am the king of space and that was definitely the king of ideas Starjacker beach volleyball Coming to a Sega SG-1000 near you. Oh, you guys suck. I don't like you.